Our next speaker, folks, has been a me was a member of the Maine legislature for 10 years. He is also the author of Attack of the Theocrats, and he is currently the director of strategy and policy for the Richard Dawkins Foundation. You're in for a treat. This is one of the most entertaining and passionate speakers I have ever had the pleasure to, to listen to. Mr. Sean Faircloth. So, I'm a white guy with a tie, and I have more confessions. Yes, I have been a politician, a lawyer, and a lobbyist. But, but I'm here to say to the young people here that if there can be lawyers and lobbyists and politicians for injustice, you can be lawyers and lobbyists and politicians for justice, and I ask you to do it. I ask you to do it. I have another confession to make. I have to say that I have never in my life really experienced serious discrimination. Now, African Americans, we can think of unforgivable violations of their civil rights, including recently. Gay people, discrimination against them to this day. But I gotta tell you the truth. For me, like Bill Gates, not religious, like Warren Buffett, not religious, I'm doing just fine. Well, well not just as fine as them, you know. But. So why am I here? I'm here to speak for fundamentalists. Yes, that's right. Or at least the children labeled fundamentalists who have their health and sometimes their very lives endangered by child protection laws, weakened for so-called faith healing. Also, child care center laws weakened for religious child cares that even neglect children. I am here for more than a million girls in fundamentalist schools today who, based on a religious loophole in Title IX, could be taught in school in 2012 that women must be subordinate. Let's speak out for those girls. It's wrong. I am here today. I am here today for the fundamentalist who is fired from a taxpayer-funded faith-based initiative because they were the wrong type of fundamentalist. True story. It's wrong. We'll speak out for them. I'm here for the religious person going blind from macular degeneration whose eyesight might be saved if religion were not impeding stem cell research. We have to stand up for that help. I am here. I am here for those children in Texas and other states who are being told lies about history and science printed in taxpayer-funded textbooks. It's going to stop. I'm here. I am here for the Muslim taxpayer. I am here for the Jewish taxpayer, and I am here for the atheist taxpayer who has our tax money grabbed out of our pockets to subsidize the mansions of mega ministers who preach hate in every town in America. At the Richard Dawkins Foundation, for reason, yes. At the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason in Science U.S., we offer a 10-point vision of a secular America, or as I call it, a modest plan to take over the United States. But, but with our plan, it is not a plan to exclude, it is rather a plan to include. Because we don't believe that any ancient document can deny any human being their human rights. <laughs> Richard Dawkins asked me, he asked me to use my 20 years of experience in politics to organize, to organize in Sarah Palin's Alaska, 
and in Michelle Bachman's Minnesota, and in Rick Santorum's Pennsylvania. And working, working with every one of you in every single state of the union, we will bring back James Madison's Constitution. We will bring back Thomas Jefferson's First Amendment. And we will bring back Jack Kennedy's America, where in Jack Kennedy's words, and I quote, the separation of church and state is absolute. We stand for that America. I tell you, I tell you today that I am devoting my life to our cause. And I ask you to devote yourselves to this cause in every single state working together. Because we're not on a mission from God, but we are on a mission from Jefferson and Madison and Kennedy. We are. Together. Together, we secular Americans are taking command of the moral high ground. We are taking the lead. And together, we are going to make a great nation even greater. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sean Faircloth! Is it exciting? Please welcome the executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation, Elizabeth Cornwell. An invisible burqa. An invisible burqa. Look around you. Look around at the women and girls near you. Look at them and recognize that they are being enslaved. Enslaved state by state by radical religionists. There is a war on the womb, a war based on dogma, a war based on ignorance, a war based on lust for power. The religious radicals want to enshroud women in an invisible burqa. They want to take away a woman's right to control her own body. This is not about declaring a blasticized as a human being. No, no. This is a war on the womb. This is about eradicating a woman's right to take her full place in society, her education, her career, and how she chooses to live her life. This, this is the radical Christian's invisible burqa. And we are here today to tell them, the, to tell the world we will not allow radicals to send women back to a position of enslavement. So I ask you to look toward Congress and I want you to tell them, we vote with me. We vote! Now, President Obama, do not allow your daughters or anyone's daughters to be enshrouded in an invisible burqa. And just behind us, just behind me, is the Jefferson Memorial. Mr. Jefferson is looking toward his home state, the Commonwealth of Virginia a state that recently enacted draconian laws invading the rights of women. Jefferson would be horrified. So now I ask you, I ask you to face toward Virginia, and I want you to proclaim loudly so the entire state can hear you. I want you to proclaim what Christopher Hitchens always proclaimed, Mr. Jefferson, Build up that wall with me. Build up that wall. Build up that wall. Build up that wall. Thank you.
Thank you. Folks, Professor Richard Dawkins. inspiring sight. I was expecting great things even in fine weather. In the rain, look at this. This is the most incredible sight I can remember ever seeing. <laughs> the sharper critical thinkers among you may have discerned that I don't come from these parts. I see myself as an emissary from a benighted country that does not have a constitutional separation between church and state. Indeed, we don't have a written constitution at all. We have a head of state who is also the head of the Church of England. The church is deeply entwined in British public life. The American constitution is a precious treasure, the envy of the world, the First Amendment to the Constitution, which enshrines the separation between church and state, is the model for secular constitutions the world over and deserves to be imitated the world over. How sad it would be if in the birthplace of secular constitutions, the very principle of a secular constitution were to be betrayed in a theocracy. And it's come close to that. How could anyone rally against reason? How is it necessary to have a rally for reason? Reason means basing your life on evidence and on logic, which is how you deduce the consequences of evidence. In a hundred years' time, it seems to me inconceivable that anybody could want to have a rally for reason. By that time, we'll either have blown ourselves up or we'll have become so civilized that we no longer need it. When I was at school, we used to sing a hymn it went, it is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be. After that, the hymn rather went off the rails, but <laughs> those first two lines uh, have inspired me ever since. It is a thing most wonderful that on this once barren rock, orbiting a rather mediocre star on the edge of a rather ordinary galaxy, on this rock, a remarkable process called evolution by natural selection has given rise to the magnificent diversity of complexity of life, the elegance, the beauty, and the illusion of design which we see all around us, has given rise in the last million years or so to a species, our species, with a brain big enough to comprehend that process, to comprehend how we came to be here, how we came to be here from extremely simple beginnings where the laws of physics were played out in very simple ways. The laws of physics have never been violated, but the laws of physics are filtered through this incredible process 
called evolution by natural selection, to give rise to a brain which is capable of understanding the process, a brain which is capable of measuring the age of the universe between 13 and 14 billion years, of measuring the age of the Earth between 4 and 5 billion years, of knowing what matter is made of, knowing what we are made of, made of atoms, brought together by this mechanical, automatic, unplanned, unconscious process, evolution by natural selection. That's not just true, it's beautiful. And it It's beautiful because it's true, and it's almost too good to be true. How is it conceivable that the laws of physics should conspire together without guidance, without direction, without any intelligence to bring us into the world? Now we do have intelligence. Intelligence comes into the world, comes into the universe late. It has come into the world through our brains and maybe other brains in the universe. Now, at last, finally, after four billion years of evolution, we have the opportunity to bring some intelligent design into the world. We need... We need intelligent design. We need in to intelligently design our morals our ethics, our politics, our society. We need to intelligently design the way we run our lives, not look back to scrolls, I was going to say ancient scrolls, they're not even very ancient. <laughs> About 800 BC, the book of Genesis was written. I am often accused of expressing contempt and despising religious people. I don't despise religious people, I despise what they stand for. I like, I like to quote the British journalist Johan Hari, who said, I have not, no contempt for you, I have, t sorry, I have so much respect for you that I cannot respect your ridiculous ideas. <laughs> the electromagnetic spectrum runs all the way from extremely long wave, in radio wave end of the spectrum to uh, gamma rays at the very short uh, wave end of, of the spectrum. And visible light, that which we can see, is a tiny little sliver in the middle of that electromagnetic spectrum. Science has broadened out our perception of that spectrum to long wave radio waves on the one hand and gamma rays on the other. I take that as being symbolic of what science does generally. It takes our little vision, our little parochial small vision and broadens it out. And that is a magnificent vision for what science can do. Science makes us see what we couldn't see before. Religion does its best to snuff out even that light which we can see. So we're here to stand up for reason, to stand up for science, to stand up for logic, to stand up for the beauty of reality and the beauty of the fact that we can understand reality. I hope that this meeting will be a turning point. I'm sure many people have said that already. I like to think of the, the physical analogy of a critical mass. There are too many people in this country who have been cowed into fear of coming out as atheists or secularists or agnostics. We are far more numerous than anybody realizes. We 
are approaching a tipping point. We're approaching that critical mass where the number of people who have come out become so great that suddenly everybody will realize, I can come out too. And that moment... That moment is not far away now, and I think that with hindsight, this rally in Washington will be seen as a very significant tipping point on the road. And I would particularly appeal to my scientific colleagues, most of whom are atheists, if you look at the members of the National Academy of Sciences, about 90% of them are non-believers, an exact mirror image of the official figures of the country at large. If you look at the Royal Society of London, the equivalent for the British Commonwealth, again, about 90% of them are atheists. But they mostly keep quiet about it. They're not ashamed of it, they just can't be bothered to come out and express what they feel. They think religion is just simply boring and they're not going to bother to even stand up and oppose it. They need to come out. Religion is an important phenomenon. 40% at least of the American population, according to opinion polls, think that the world, the universe indeed, is less than 10,000 years old. That's not just an error, that's a preposterous error. I've if I've done the calculation before, and it's equivalent to believing that the width of North America from Washington to San Francisco is equal to about eight yards. <laughs> I don't know that I believe that 40% figure. It's, it stands up, it's been apparently so for about ever since the 1980s. But what I want to suggest you do when you meet somebody who claims to be religious, ask them what they really believe. If you meet somebody who says he's Catholic, for example, say, what do you mean? Do you just mean you were baptized Catholic? Because I'm not impressed by that. <laughs> we just ran a poll by my foundation in Britain, just ran a poll in Britain in which we took those people who had ticked the Christian box in the census, and by the way, that figure has come down dramatically. We just took the people who ticked the Christian box, and we asked them, why did you tick the Christian box? And the most popular answer to that question was, oh, well, I like to think of myself as a good person. <laughs> well, we all like to think of ourselves as, a, as good people. Atheists do, Jews do, Muslims do. So when you meet somebody who claims to be Christian, ask her, ask him, what do you really believe? And I think you'll find that in many cases, they, uh, they give you an answer which is no more convincing than that I like to be a good person. By the way, when we went on to ask a specific question of these uh, only 54%, what do you do when you're faced with a moral dilemma? Where do you turn? Only 10% turned to their religion when trying to solve a moral question. Only 10%. The majority of them, the majority of them said, I turn to my innate sense of goodness. And the next most popular answer was I turn for advice to relatives and friends. So when I meet somebody who claims to be religious, my first impulse is don't believe you. I don't believe you until you tell me do you really believe, for example, if they say they're Catholic, do you really believe that when a priest blesses a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ? Are you seriously telling me you believe that? <laughs> Are you seriously saying that wine turns into blood? Mock them, ridicule them. in public. <laughs> Don't fall for the convention that we're all too polite to talk about religion. Religion is not off the table. Religion is not off limits. 
religion makes specific claims about the universe which need to be substantiated and need to be challenged and, if necessary, need to be ridiculed with contempt. I want to echo what my colleagues from the Richard Dawkins Foundation have said. Uh, I am an outsider, but we have, we're well staffed in America and we're going to uh, spread the word along with our colleagues in other organizations throughout the length and breadth of this land. This land which is the fountainhead, the birthplace of secularism in the world. And as I said before, don't let's let that tradition down. Thank you very much. Yeah.